Welcome to Roots of the CLT, Chapter 3. I'm John Davis, the producer and narrator for this presentation, commissioned by the National CLT Network. Previously, we examined key characteristics of the classic CLT and traced the history behind the model's unique approach to ownership. In Chapter 3, we're going to look at the history behind the next cluster of characteristics, those related to the way a CLT is structured organizationally. There are three organizational characteristics that allow us to call a leased land arrangement a community land trust. They were introduced in Chapter 1. Here they are again. The people who did the most to add these organizational elements are pictured here. I'm going to talk about who they were and how they influenced one another, working together in the 1960s to lay the foundation for the modern day CLT. Bob Swan was probably the first to recognize that what was lacking in the land trust pioneered by Borsodi and others was an open membership. A land trust could be made stronger, he believed, by involving more people in guiding and governing the organization, a group much larger than the leaseholder living on a CLT's land. As a young man, Swan was introduced to Baird Rustin, then the Youth Secretary for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Rustin was later to become one of the most influential leaders and strategists of the Civil Rights Movement. The 1963 March on Washington was Rustin's idea, and he served as its main organizer. Under the influence of Rustin, Swan made a fateful decision while auditing courses at the University of Ohio. He would resist induction into the armed forces. In 1942, he was sentenced to five years in prison. While in prison, Swan took a correspondence course about the small community. He was exposed to the writings of Lewis Mumford and Ralph Borsodi, both of whom influenced his later thinking. But the book that most impressed him was one written by the person who had created the course he was taking, Arthur Morgan. After his time at TVA, Morgan had returned to Ohio and started Community Service Incorporated to spread his ideas about decentralized economic development. Swan began writing to Morgan while still in prison. Two years after his release, he was offered a job at CSI, so he moved with his young family to Yellow Springs. Bob soon realized, however, that the job promised by Morgan was office work, which did not interest him. He began building houses instead, earning his living as an itinerant carpenter and small house designer. A series of construction jobs sent the Swan family to Kalamazoo, Chicago, and Philadelphia. Around 1960, they finally settled in Voluntown, Connecticut. Both Bob and his wife, Marjorie, had become deeply involved with peacemakers and the Committee for Nonviolent Action two of the first groups to use civil disobedience in opposing the buildup of America's nuclear arsenal. Climbing the fence at a missile site outside of Omaha, where Marge was arrested in 1959, was a typical action. The Swans moved to Voluntown in part so they could staff CNVA, organizing regular protests in nearby New London, where the first submarines armed with nuclear weapons were being assembled. In the fall of 1962, Bob traveled to Mississippi to supervise a Quaker-sponsored construction crew rebuilding black churches that had been firebombed by Southern racists. During his time in the South, Swan came to realize that part of the oppression and insecurity of African Americans was due to their limited access to land. He also heard that many black farmers were being forced off the land in retaliation for registering to vote. Swan's ruminations about the land question became more focused in 1965 when a friend introduced him to Ralph Borsodi, who had just returned to the U.S. after four years in India. Swan was familiar with Borsodi's writings, which he had read in prison, and he had friends at Bryn Gwilydd, the least land community inspired by Borsodi's school of living, but he had never met Borsodi in person. Swan and Borsodi found that they shared many interests, especially a mutual admiration for the work of Vinoba Bhave, the walking saint of India. 
After Gandhi's assassination in 1948, political leadership of this movement fell to Nehru. Spiritual leadership fell to Vinoba Bhave. Gandhi had spoken of the need for a constructive program to follow India's independence from Britain. He'd envisioned a decentralized economy based on autonomous, self-reliant villages. He had extolled the principle of trusteeship, asserting that land and other assets that individuals possess beyond what they personally needed should be shared with all, especially India's lower caste and rural poor. Vinova Bhave made Gandhi's vision his own. To call attention to the plight of the poor, he began walking across India, asking rich landowners to donate some of their holdings. Hundreds complied. The land gift program, the Budan movement, was born. At its height, Bave and his followers were collecting thousands of acres every week and conveying title to impoverished individuals. By 1954, three million acres had been redistributed. But many poor families quickly lost the small plots they had been given. Seeing this, Bave changed course. He now insisted that any gifts of land be donated to a local village trust, which would lease the land to farmers. The land gift program became the village gift program, the Gromdon movement. By the time Borsodi returned to America, more than 160,000 Gromdon villages had been established. What Borsodi saw in the Gromdon movement was an affirmation of his own ideas about rebuilding rural economies on the basis of self-sufficient villages. Settling in Exeter, New Hampshire, he created a new nonprofit to promote this model in other countries, including his own. He appointed himself executive director and chairman of the board. Bob Swan was named the Institute's field director with responsibility for making Gromdon a reality in the United States. Over the next 20 years, the Institute regularly changed its logo, location, and eventually its name. In 1972, it moved to Boston and became the Institute for Community Economics. All this talk about creating a Gromdon movement in America remained fairly abstract, however, until Swan began working with two brothers in Albany, Georgia. C.B. King and Slater King were leaders of the Albany movement, a campaign to eradicate segregation in their corner of the South. The white city council vowed this would never happen. The library was closed rather than to allow blacks to check out books. Nets were cut off tennis courts rather than allow blacks to play. Protest marches resulted in mass jailings. When Martin Luther King and Ralph Abernathy were invited to town by the Albany movement, they were tossed in jail as well. The attorney to whom most of the jailed protesters turned was C.B. King. He was one of only three African-American lawyers in the entire state at the time and the only one practicing law in southwest Georgia. When Albany's jails overflowed, hundreds of protesters were sent to jails in the surrounding counties, where rural deputies were more likely to abuse black inmates. C.B. himself was assaulted when visiting one of his clients. His younger brother was the owner of a local business, selling real estate and insurance. Slater King was elected vice president of the Albany movement, in 1961 and two years later became the president, leading marches, convening mass meetings, and attempting to negotiate with a recalcitrant city council. This was not without risk to himself and his family. Slater King's wife, Marion, joined other wives in bringing supplies to protesters who had been bused to jails outside of Albany. While visiting those jailed in the town of Camilla, she was beaten to the ground by two policemen. She was six months pregnant at the time and lost her unborn baby. Another key figure in the Albany struggle was Charles Sherrod, an organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. He and his SNCC comrade, Cordell Regan, were the young Turks nipping at the heels of their elders, constantly urging more militant action. They stirred up the college students at Albany State. In 
They occupied the whites-only waiting room at the bus station. They trudged through the countryside, knocking on doors of farmers, migrants, and sharecroppers doing voter registration. Sherrod moved to Albany in 1961 and never left. Long after the Albany movement had ebbed, he kept doing grassroots organizing against segregated schools, segregated housing, and other vestiges of Jim Crow. His work was supported by SNCC and later by the Southwest Georgia Project, an organization that he founded and staffed along with his wife, Shirley. Charles Sherrod experienced firsthand what Bob Swan had only heard rumors about, African-American families being kicked out of their homes and losing their jobs because they had registered to vote or raised their voices against segregation. He came to believe that owning land was one of the only ways that African-Americans in the South would ever have the economic security to demand their rights without harming their families. The president of the Albany movement gradually came to the same conclusion, perhaps on his own, perhaps through the prodding of Sherrod, or perhaps through his unlikely friendship with Bob Swan. I say unlikely because here was a black college-educated businessman in the Deep South and a white, self-educated home builder from the Midwest, forming a partnership and becoming friends during a very turbulent time while both were grappling with the same question that Gandhi had posed. What comes after all the marching and protest? The bond of trust that quickly formed between these men was precipitated, I believe, by two accidents of history, where their paths had previously converged. The first convergence was Koinonia Farm, a Christian community founded near Albany in 1942 by the Reverend Clarence Jordan. Because of the racial mixing allowed at Koinonia, and because of Jordan's unpopular views on racial equality, local businesses began a 10-year boycott in 1956, refusing to sell Koinonia needed supplies or to buy its products. Homegrown terrorists tied to the Ku Klux Klan took a more violent tack, firing guns into Koinonia's buildings, torching its roadside stand, and demanding the farm be sold. Clarence and his colleagues stayed put. They kept on farming, and Clarence kept on preaching, a gospel-based message opposed to racism, materialism, and militarism, which must have sounded downright un-American to the ears of his southern neighbors. As Koinonia's troubles mounted, a steady stream of visitors provided encouragement and support. C.B. King, Slater King, and their wives came regularly to Koinonia for weekend dinners. Bob and Marge Swan joined a parade of pacifists who traveled to Koinonia to bear witness and offer aid. For several years, Bob served as the national chairman of Friends of Koinonia, a network organized to raise money for Koinonia and to sell its pecans in the face of the ongoing boycott by local businesses. We don't know whether the Swans' visits coincided with those of the Kings, but there was clearly a Koinonia connection with Clarence in the middle, creating common ground. What we do know is that Bob and Slater were among the 15 trusted advisors summoned to Americas in 1968 by Clarence and his friend, Millard Fuller, to discuss a new direction for Koinonia. These discussions resulted in the creation of a self-help housing program for low-income families named Koinonia Partners that became the forerunner of Habitat for Humanity. Swan and King emerged from that same meeting and got busy planning an innovation of their own that was to become the forerunner for all the CLTs that followed. Two different movements sprouting from the same Koinonia seedbed. Another chance convergence may help to explain the ease that Bob and Slater found in each other's company. At least 20 years prior to their first meeting, when the Swans were living in Yellow Springs, Marjorie began attending meetings of a local group affiliated with CORE. There she met an Antioch undergraduate who was majoring in music and education. They became lifelong friends 
When Bob and Marge wanted a night out, they sometimes hired her as a babysitter. This student was Coretta Scott, who later married a reverend from Atlanta, a cousin of the Kings in Albany. Meanwhile, another woman was to have a more direct influence on the budding partnership between Bob Swan and Slater King. She was Faye Bennett, for 18 years the executive director of the National Sharecroppers Fund. NSF was dedicated to improving living conditions of the rural poor. So fierce was Faye Bennett's advocacy for these vulnerable people that the chair of her board named her the Joan of Arc of agricultural workers. Bennett's gravest concern was for black sharecroppers in the South who were being pushed off the land in growing numbers. In the 1960s, the National Sharecroppers Fund expanded its programming to include construction of affordable housing and the creation of agricultural cooperatives, two strategies for combating rural displacement. In 1966, Bennett attended a conference organized by Borsodi and Swan discussing the Gromdon model of rural development. She was intrigued and later joined the board of Borsodi's Institute. In 1968, her organization provided most of the funding for an American delegation to travel to Israel to learn about cooperative agricultural communities established on leased land. Eight people made the month-long trip to Israel, including the four pictured here. They were drawn to the Moshav, a mixed model that combined individual homesteads, agricultural cooperatives, and ground leasing. They returned to the United States convinced this model had potential for empowering African Americans in the rural South. They introduced this idea at a meeting in Atlanta the month after their return. It was well received. A planning committee was formed to create a blueprint for a leasehold model of rural development. A year later, the committee approved a set of bylaws drafted by C.B. King. The name they chose for their new nonprofit was New Communities Incorporated. Slater King was elected president and the search for land began. New communities took an option on an old plantation outside of Albany. But as they started looking for the million dollars they would need to close the deal, they had a terrible setback. Slater King was killed in a car accident. The board decided to press on. Charles Sherrod was asked to become the new president. He packed his bags, kissed his wife Shirley goodbye, and headed to New York City, where Faye Bennett and Bob Swan were ready to help with the search for financing. New Communities managed to close on its option on January 9, 1970 coming into possession of 3,000 acres of farmland and over 2,000 acres of woodland, at the time the largest tract of land owned by African Americans in the United States. The story of new communities became the basis for the first book about CLTs, published in 1972. The authors confessed that the model they described existed only in prototype, yet they spelled out the key components of ownership and organization that characterize CLTs today. In particular, they drew upon the experiences of Koinonia Farm, the Albany Movement, and the civil rights struggle to argue that a radical innovation like the CLT was going to need a base of support much broader than the people living on the land if it was going to succeed. By 1972, therefore, Two of the three components of the classic CLT had been put in place, at least conceptually. It would be another decade, however, before they were fully realized in a new generation of CLTs that added operational features all their own. We'll take up that story in the next chapter.